All right, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world. Um, and welcome to this session of the symposium, Informal, Formal Urbanism, the Challenges of Co-Production. My name is Crystal Legacy and I'm Deputy Director of INFER, the Informal Urbanism Research Hub at the University of Melbourne. While we are from many parts of this wonderful planet, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the particular place upon which this event is being hosted, and that's the Rwandri people of the Kulin Nation, whose land was invaded in the early 19th century and was never ceded. This session is entitled Co-Production and Governance and involves 10 minute presentations from our guests. We'll then turn, we'll then have substantial time for discussion, which I'll manage as best as I can through the regular Zoom functions available to us, the chat box, of course. So please keep your microphones muted and please also submit your name into the chat box throughout the presentations. And I will look forward to inviting you to asking your questions once the presentations have concluded. Our first speaker is Karina Putri. Uh, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne. Her talk today is titled Co-Production Social Justice, Resettlement Planning in Jakarta. Our second speaker is Alexander De Silva Festino, who is also a PhD candidate but at RMIT University in the Center for Urban Research. His talk today is entitled Co-Production Urban Waterscapes in Brazil. And our third speakers are Michele Acuto and Miriam Carini. Michele is Professor of Urban Politics and Director of the Connected Cities Lab at the University of Melbourne. And Miriam is a postdoctoral research fellow at um, Politecnico de Milano, um, and their talk is entitled Staging Dubai, Mapping the In-Between of Urban Governance. So uh, I want to thank uh, all of them for their time today, and I look forward to hearing those three presentations. Now, without further ado, I'd like to just turn it over to Karina to start us off with her 10-minute presentation. So Karina, the floor, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for everyone. Uh, thank you, Crystal, Kim, and also Redden and Tanzil for organizing this session. It's really a great pleasure for me to be part of this panel today. My name is Karina. I'm a PhD student from the University of Melbourne. And the title of my presentation for today is uh, Co-Production of Social Justice, Resettlement Planning in Jakarta. And I will begin my presentation by telling you the story of the Fluid Reservoir Resettlement in Jakarta. So this is a Fluid Reservoir, one of the largest uh, man-made retention basin located in the northern part of Jakarta. The reservoir itself was designed as one of the key infrastructure to tackle flood in, uh, in the capital city of Indonesia. So basically, one of the role of this reservoir is to contain the excess water from the central water flow system in Jakarta before the excess water is pumped directly into the sea. The reservoir itself was built in mid 60s and was finalized in early 80s. But soon after the, the development was finalized, the reservoir and also its surrounding area becomes, it, it turns into a homes for thousands of illegal uh, informal settlers. So a process that uh, I might consider related to what Asaf Bayat mentioned as quiet encroachment. So started, as you can see from the picture here, started from the eastern side of the reservoir, the informal settlement was, were expanded to the western part, which is originally designed as a green open spaces and also cover part of the reservoir surface itself. Uh, as you can see in 2000, at around 2012, this is the conditions of the reservoir. It was highly sedimented, and at the time, frequent dredging was considered almost impossible because access to the reservoir is blocked by the uh, informal housing. So what happened next is that in between 2013 and 2015, around 7,000 of informal households were resettled from this reservoir and its surrounding area to at least five different public housing across Jakarta. The main trigger for this resettlement 
uh, is the was the early 2013 big flood that hit Jakarta. So at the time, this reservoir played a very crucial role in maintaining or containing the excess water. But at the time, uh, approximately 85% of the container capacity of this reservoir was already affected. And the initial 10 meter dip of this reservoir has been reduced into approximately only one meter because of the sedimentation and also the rubbish produced by the informal settler. And uh, interestingly, this settlement was considered by many as a great uh, example of a successful resettlement because it was uh, conducted with a considerably little conflict and resistance from the affected population. However, in that interview that I've conducted with the urban planners, decision makers, and also local bureaucrats, and also focus group discussion with the relocated resident, Reveal that the resettlement indeed was conducted through a very informal processes. So at the time what happened is that an informal actor outside the government machinery was appointed to be the coordinator of the resettlement. And then this informal actor was uh, assessing the people's property value through a very uh, informal process. So he, before he offered a certain amount of financial compensation to the affected population. So for instance, he came to one of the informal housing and say that, okay, so I, uh, I think the value of your shack is around 1 million rupiah or approximately 100 Australian dollar, for instance. And that informal negotiation and bargaining with the affected population was conducted afterward. So in line with what Kurt Eisen have mentioned previously in this webinar series, elite informality was apparent throughout the Pluit Reservoir resettlement process. And by informality, in the sense, uh, I argue it best defined according to McFarland proposition as a set of practice or a strategy to get things done. And indeed, informality was used as a strategy by the then uh, Jakarta's official to get the resettlement done. Um, but apparently this official didn't work alone. They were actually engaging with some members of the affected resident to ensure that just resettlement was conducted. So I argue that in this context, a state initiated co-production was at play. But uh, the question is, who are actually engaged by the then Jakarta's official during their settlement processes? Who benefits and who loses from these informal processes? So the aim of my today's presentation is to bring the attention to the often overlooked range of actors in the establishment and maintenance of informal processes. Because uh, I argue that for a co-production to happen, it must be that the government work with a partner. And the question is, from uh, the, the context of the reservoir is which of the affected population, which group of the pop affected population was actually engaged by the government. So uh, from my research, from a detailed scrutiny of the informal resident input reservoir, uh, show that the informal settler can be classified into two big groups, those with accumulation network and those with survival networks. So I use this terminology survival and accumulation according to Nicola Bang uh, account of accumulation and a survival network. So this, uh, those with survival network were actually the people who have a very limited capacity in terms of opportunities for advancement and to move forward. They were actually the one who struggle for their day-to-day -day life basis and often very passive and cannot afford to have a house or a shack built on land. So most of them were actually built the house on top of the water. And those with the accumulation actor are people who have more capacity and opportunity because they have more resources. And sometimes they also have more connection with the authority or the local authority. So uh, in the case of Pluto Reservoir Settlement, those with the accumulation network are actually the people who were initially occupied the green open spaces in the western part of the area. So they were actually the one who divided the land parcel and sell it to other people, to those with the more survival network. And interestingly, 
in that interview in FUDF, uh, eventually revealed that for most of the time, the Jakarta's official at the time were mainly engaged by those with the accumulation, uh, actor with the accumulation network. As you can see from one of the interview excerpt here, he has clearly mentioned that prior to their settlement, communication with actor with accumulation network has been established. So these actor uh, were given the role as broker that helped government to connect with the other members of the uh, reservoir resident. And at the same time, they were also asked to quietly persuade the other people to move. Then for most of the time, the role of this broker persuasion works because uh, most of this uh, so-called actor with accumulation network is actually called or recognized as a local leader, local champion, and also the father of the community. So sometimes whatever they say is considered as a guidance for those with the survival network. So when, when this kind of actor asks other people to move or to resettle to the public housing provided by the government, those with a survival network usually comply. And then the question, the next question is, who actually benefit and who loses from this kind of uh, informal resettlement arrangement? Well, I, I found out that actually almost uh, apparent that it's government and the actor with accumulation network were benefiting the most from the resettlement processes. So the government were able to clear out the reservoir through the revitalization process and with, with uh, very little conflict with the population. And at the same time, actor with the accumulation network were promised several benefits if they were able to, en to encourage people to uh, resettle to their public housing. And according to the planning documents as well, those who will be prioritized to get the Rusun unit or the public housing were actually the one who has property or the property owner. And who are this property owner? Actually, it was again, those actor with the accumulation network. Because for those who are uh, with a survival network, they often cannot afford to have their own property in that, in that area. So it is rather unsurprising to find out during the research that some of the relocated residents own more than one resettlement unit. So they get more than one Rusun at the same time. While other, mostly the survival actor, actually uh, having a very uh, cramping situation or receive a very partial resettlement and yeah, sometimes they are also expecting to find their own solution from this uh, resettlement processes. So Karina, you're at 10 minutes now. So, yeah. so finally, some reflection. I argue that informality as a strategy should be viewed in a more critical manner. Because when we saw from idea last presentation about cooperation in Malang, there were actually a potential power imbalance that made prior during the production process. And if you go back to Ryan Delphine's supportive tolerance uh, notion, uh, it, it should be, I think it's really important for us to be more cautiously considered to whom the tolerance should be given. Is it to the those with the accumulation network, those with the survival network, or both, and what implication might, uh, might result from this decision? Thank you. Just trying to unmute myself. Thank you, Karina, for your presentation. Um, so now we're gonna just sw swiftly turn over to, to Alex for his 10 minute presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please log them in the chat function by um, placing your question or just inserting your name and we'll, we'll come to them towards the end of our session together. Alex, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Crystal. Uh, just sharing my screen with my presentation here. Um, such a pleasure to participate in this debate today. So I'm PhD candidate at the uh, Ramat University, the program of Global Urban Social Studies. And for my presentation, I brought um, some reflections from my, the bodies of theory that I've been using to work uh, on my, my PhD research, uh, discussing relations between society and nature, society and water, how that can be, uh, what can that illuminate in our debates when thinking about uh, informality and informality, and as well uh, how the actions of grassroots uh, groups working in the peripheries of Sao Paulo, the city where I'm from in Brazil, uh, might be creating alternative ways to imagine uh, our escapes and our relations with land. So uh, I would like to start 
bringing this consideration to how we think um, relations between formal and informal uh, in a manner that rejects the by any kind of binary or antagonistic perception of these two uh, modes of production, where in fact they 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 reproduce they they present as images of the same uh, same system of social relations designed by unequal uh, forces of power that simultaneously produce the formal and informal as part of the same the same process. So taking ideas from uh, Ermia Maricato, one of our greatest scholars in Brazil, discussed debating about informality in our country, we would see how sometimes the norm is the exception and the exception is the norm. Um, and considering one of the discussions we had in our previous sessions, uh, they were asking for maybe new ideas or conceptual frameworks in informality to see the intersection between the social and economic process in the formation of informality. I would like to bring this idea of urban spoliation. This is a core concept in part of our discussion of informality and the peripheral territories in our cities. Um, that was proposed in the 70s by Lucio Kovaric, one of our great sociologists, when he observed that the low wages given to the working class during the peak of our industrialization and urbanization process created this condition in a context where the pro private property prevails, um, where the cl working class, by not having the economic means to access, to, to access land and technical support in the provision of housing and infrastructures, would lead to this process of widespread creation of conditions of informality. And that shows, uh, highlight, illuminates a little bit uh, how this intersection of the economic and social dimensions might explain the process of informality reproduction. Um, and from my, my work and my, my research, I've um, been mobilizing mostly ideas from the urban political ecology theory and it brings uh, some core principles when trying to understand this social process in place uh, where we should look at the power system driving the flows of capital in space and we might look at how certain objects reflect these flows and, and process in our cities we might look at how infrastructures or wiring infrastructures uh, reflect those process of uneven power relations and when perceiving these conditions, we could provide critics to the systems. Uh, inside this body of literature, we would find hydrosocial uh, theory as one of the areas discussing the relations between water and, and, and society. And from that, we would see how these both dimensions, nature and society, water and society, are hybrid objects produced by the relations they hold between each other. And waterscapes could be a framework to observe these relations and these dynamics of power in a geographical, geographical place. Um, uh, taking this back to Brazil and Sao Paulo, we would see how in the, in the urbanization of Sao Paulo, uh, the segregation of poverty was pushed and merged with the process of social environmental exclusion led by the strategies of the elite of the city to assure their political, economic, and social domination over this territory. And in the same way, this social environmental exclusion uh, uh, reinforces the same, the same process. And when we observe circumstances such as the present of the COVID crisis or what other water, water crisis, when these, uh, these spaces are, find, uh, are found without basic infrastructures to access water and sanitation. But here as well, I bring these examples from uh, indigenous communities that still resist and live in the highly urbanized territory of, of Sao Paulo, but protecting part of their still remains of Atlantic forest. So they are situated also in the peripheries and have been constantly uh, resisting and building practices of care and restoration of the land, but had, had found uh, in this in this moment of partnership between uh, and support with local government and other organizations supporting their causes, created this 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 program, the program, the Aldeias program, which capitalized um, part of the initiatives, the projects they were already um, putting in place, um, but supporting, providing a means of empowerment for their for their culture, 
for the way of life and for their territories. So here they're creating, experimenting uh, with regenerative practice of provision of water and sanitation. Uh, they're both uh, resolving demands of the community and as well regenerating environmentally degraded areas of their land. And throughout this process, we can also observe the empowerment of their political uh, and their political resistance and the increasing of the uh, of their voice in this context. So they are also sitting against uh, the ongoing devastation perpetrated by the dominant urbanization uh, unfolding in Sao Paulo. So here it is, is an episode of this year where they stopped the uh, this project of housing promoted by a uh, by real estate market in the in the borders of the land that devastated 4,000 sacred and protect, protected trees of, of their land. Um, and and given because of their, their resistance, the, the process could be stopped for a while, and but at the same time escalated and, and gave uh, visibility to what was happening. And overall, we would see that uh, since from the beginning, the uh, taking back the, uh, for the Pro Aldeas program, uh, this was a, a conceived from the own practices of the, the community, but uh, supported by the network of actors that come, came together to, to, to form the idea of this project. So we would see also the strengthening of the, the political leadership and the increasing of the participation of the youth in, the, in this process, creating new leaderships for the community. And as well as I step, uh, some of the activities, stepping in the formal system of politics where now the community is proposing a policy of green belt, including their, their, their lands um, to provide more protection for the Atlantic forest and by consequence, uh, taking care of their cultural values and their way of being and living. So what we will see is how this process of social empowerment and emancipation operates, uh, it unfolds in a cumulative uh, reinforcing manner where one action creates momentum and space for other actions and, and increasing the voice of the community in, in the following steps. Um, but as well, I think it brings uh, brings us into questioning uh, when we look at alternatives that are being enabled from the informal context uh, and exposing the limits of the modes of formal production, what can we imagine uh, from the situation? Uh, what can we learn and, and, and what can, how can we move on into, into new alternatives from, from this practice? And from the debate here, uh, for a little provocation for the debate here in co-production of governance, we see the, the role of the local government in conceiving this project, providing the support for, for it to happen. But at the same time, we could ask who is participating, which part of the government is participating in such process. So we would see how in this case was the municipal secretary of culture, uh, whereas where was the the secretaries of environment, of urbanism, of public infrastructure that might be also relevant to participate in this process. Um, so questioning who who and what parts of the local government is creating also the systems of co-production co should be a relevant question for us to take forward. Well, those are the main ideas for my presentation today. I'm looking forward for the comments and discussion next. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Alex, for your presentation. Um, and now we're just going to turn uh, to Michaela and Miriam uh, for their presentation. Virtual floor is now yours. Super. Thank, thanks, Crystal. Thank Danzil and the um, Infor team. Um, I'm going to try and do us justice because we dragged Marian out of bed at 6 a.m. Uh, so you can blame all inaccuracies on my incapacity to present. Uh, I'll, this, this is out of a paper that Marian and I have written that is in review at the moment um, about informality in Dubai. Uh, uh, so the, I'll, I'll talk you through it, but I thought I'd sort of start with the story that we start that paper with, uh, which is out of sort of a piece of work that I've uh, a colleague and a good friend, um, Yasser al uh has had done. Um, so this is rewinding back a couple of years uh, uh, to the 2016 Venice Biennale. Uh, the 
the pavilion of the United Arab Emirates, um, uh, obviously within which uh, Dubai is situated, uh, was commissioned and curated by Yasser, uh, who proceeded on putting this fabulous show about uh, uh, what's called the Shabi uh, housing system or the Shabi house, which is just simply translates roughly into the house for the people, the people's house. Uh, and it was the, and it is the national uh, Emirati housing system. Um, and, it, and it was a provoca subtly provocative in the sense that it described the story of these uh, houses originally designed in the 60s to house uh, Bedouins uh, uh, to settle in places like Dubai and Abu Dhabi uh, and very much designed uh, to, uh, to a pretty basic template without much care for, I guess, sort of the, the, the setup in itself or cultural values or, or, or necess necessarily particularly needs. Um, this is miles away from the glitz of the skyscrapers and uh, the, the images that you normally would see of places like Dubai and Abu Dhabi, uh, but it's a fabulous story. And there's a really great paper that, that then Yasser wrote in 2019 about how it's a fundamental story of the in-between of uh, the glitz of the skyscrapers and I guess sort of the more uh, acute uh, situation of uh, lower socioeconomical um, uh, contexts in places like Dubai, and it tells the story of the informality in it of uh, the um, the national housing uh, residents tinkering with little bits, moving uh, 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 moving a wall, adding some foliage, uh, playing with things, and he really says, well, this really doesn't happen in something that is formal, it isn't sanctioned by the state, but it isn't prohibited and policed by the state either. It sort of sits in an in-between of informality uh, and in a rejection that isn't necessarily a, an open rejection of the state itself or the politics of that state, uh, but a rejection of, uh, of a mode of living that gets tinkered progressively on and on and on. Um, so we, 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 we took a bit of a, a creative license on that, on that initial thought, but I guess sort of we really wanted to explore that in between. And something that really comes out of that story and many other stories is, uh, and, and this was sort of at the time where we were working also sort of on a, on a, on a special issue of urban studies on informality was obviously the, that neither the form or the form of work for that story uh, as either ontological or, or even legal sort of definitions of what's happening. Uh, but I guess one element of that was that it was bubbling up, and that's what our paper predominantly is about, is, a, is about understanding how informality and informal relations are not just uh, uh, next to the governing, but they are part of the governing of a place. So they're sort of inherent to urban governance. They're, in a sense, the texture of urban governance. Uh, and not just us saying it, uh, um, in, in, there's a great paper in 2008 by Lindell uh, and, and a number of others. So for instance, we take out of um, Hannah Hildbrandt and colleagues in 2017, they started talking about informality as a way, in fact, uh, uh, of statecraft, of governing, uh, which I think it sort of con goes well back onto uh, the first uh, that we started to do today, but actually the very first that you started uh, in the Infra Symposium, because we're borrowing and up, we started a bit later in the, in the presentations, but from Faiza Moatzim, and the idea that uh, 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 the elite informality uh, itself is a real way of governing that exists out there. So in a sense, uh, we want to sort of play a bit with that uh, um, and apply to the context of Dubai. Now to do that, uh, and I won't go too much in length with this, but what we've done is uh, recognize that actually in political science and in other contexts uh, uh, like that, there's quite a good uh, uh, literature of how to analyze this some, somewhat systematically. So we borrow from uh, a number of political scientists, uh, European political scientists, Van Tatenhoven and others, uh, that have tried to, in a sense, cite informality where it happens in different contexts of governance. Uh, and similar, Oren Tackle has talked about, talked about a lot of gray spaces uh, happening in cities. What we really want to show with the story is, uh, in a sense, that it isn't just that it's uh, not a dichotomous reality, but also that there are different types of encounters between the formal and the informal, or the informal and the informal, and that the informal itself uh, is uh, in itself a mode of governing uh, of not just the elite, but a variety of powers that they that be in, um, in urban governance. So in a sense, we play with this sort of matrix uh, of what's sanctioned and not sanctioned, uh, uh, what sit on, uh, and that's a bit of a nod to uh, or Goffman and sort of the idea of stages and performance, uh, what's on the front stage directed by rules, uh, and what's in the backstage. 
And all of that, um, we do sort of through the story, and I won't talk you through that, it's just a, sort of a bite-sized version of it, but we do it through the story of how urban governance in Dubai came to be. And the story of urban governance itself in Dubai is a story of, in a sense, the informalization of urban governance, uh, the creation of a, a variety of gray spaces, not just uh, a type of gray spaces. So for instance, protection agreements uh, in the 1980s uh, uh, with merchants that then led to tax heaven set up, so tax, uh, free, sp free tax zones set up, so, but also what having called sovereignty bargains, for instance, for expatriates um, to acquire cert certain rights whilst not being citizens, uh, uh, the kafala system that, that sort of uh, 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 constructs how a migrant, especially sort of construction workers, uh, exists within a highly top-down context like, uh, like the Emirates, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so in a sense, what I'm trying to gesture to there and sort of do quite a length in the paper is uh, it, the story of the emergence of urban governance itself is uh, uh, packed with the ways in which uh, informality plays and that the state itself, um, I guess, deploys in a variety of stages and backstages as well, not just sort of the front stage or a backstage. And that also, it isn't about just, uh, uh, I guess, confrontation of the state uh, and rejection of the state, but there's a lot of uh, mundane negotiations uh, in other stages um, that are at play. Now, this goes uh, through the farcical slash uh, uh, ironic and so on, the state uh, doing something very similar to what actually Kurt Iverson was doing in, the, in one of the keynotes of the symposium. Uh, uh, this is a campaign by the state itself uh, at the height of the financial crisis to convince people that Dubai was still in play and to convince people to take the metro as sort of the, one of the largest expenses of the state itself. Uh, and rather than doing it through the glitz of uh, and, gla and glamour of big launches, it was done on essentially graffitis on cars uh, uh, and, and exploiting the in-between of what can be done there. And it took, it took hold beautifully actually between expatriates uh, and much more effectively perhaps a sort of a, a, a PR campaign. But this was done by Saatchi and Saatchi. It was paid for by the state itself. Um, same story that you could tell, for instance, how uh, the governance of Dubai emerges and emerges uh, as a, um, a, some, some authors have talked about a sort of a, a two-part uh, governance, the official and the non-official, but this exp expands to sort of three levels of governance. There's what's called the Mashli system of uh, informal consultation and meetings. Uh, there's the actual municipality and the government, uh, and then there's the development part of the story where parts of the ruling family are also owners uh, of a variety of companies and holdings and setups. Um, now, all of this to say there isn't sort of a just the state at the top and the people at the bottom. There's a lot in between uh, that, that is about the negotiations of that, that governance system. And, and all of this complexity sort of plays with each other. Uh, and even within sort of the ruling family and, and state, uh, there's disagreements that are functioning through the system. Uh, and at the same time, last sort of quick example, that this, the system itself uh, uses informal means to, in a sense, sort of formalize uh, 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 useful elements of the governance and a story, a famous story that was a few years back in the papers uh, was that the, the government, and this is the fairy tale government, not just the Dubai government, realized the, the value of uh, informal, an informal cricket league that had emerged uh, with the construction workers uh, playing in vacant parking lots and construction sites uh, and made it a bit of a, a quintessential Emirati story, uh, the recognition of them uh, sort of being the heroes that construct and build. Um, so to wrap it up on that, I think the interesting thing for us that comes out of that is, is the interplay be between these different stages where informality happens and how that interplay is used by the state itself and by the elite, not just by the, con uh, I guess, the the, the circumvention of subpolitics against those elites uh, um, to formulate urban governance uh, and how there's a continual coexistence of this, these multiple types all at the same time, uh, whilst uh, perhaps from time to time we sort of, uh, and this is again in Ilprint uh, and others uh, that point at the fact that we tend to bias the history of informality towards a lack of state capacity rather than the state itself uh, being the informal actor in many cases. Um, and I'll leave it at that.
Thank you, Michaeli and Miriam for the presentation. Um, I can see some questions. Um, just stop share. Just getting to that. <laughs> okay, as, as, <laughs> as you work out the technology. Um, there we go, thank you. Oh, and I can see everyone now. Um, look, thank you every, and thank you for the presentations. Um, as you log your, your question, and you don't need to type the whole question in because I'm actually gonna ask you to, to tell us your question, because uh, it's really lovely to see faces um, as much as possible. But before I do that, I just want to see if there are any questions from the panelists to each other. Any, any threads or any questions uh, that you have um, that you'd like to lead with. Can I, Crystal? All right, Karina, please. Yes, I was thinking that this panel is, uh, I can see that there's a really thread or connection between the, these three, three presentation because uh, from my presentation, I, I think that it's highly connected with uh, Michelle and Miriam. Uh, Mariam uh, said about the state itself is the informal actor, which is really uh, well fitted with my case of re resettlement. Yeah, so I, I can see that there is a clear connection and link between these three presentation things. Yeah, thank you, Karina. Anyone else? Yes. Can I, can you go hear for me? it, Mar Please. Okay, perfect. I'm trying. <laughs> Uh, so I totally agree with Karina and thank you, Michele, for your presentation. Amazing work you did. <laughs> um, so I, you know, my observation after reading the abstract and also watching the presentation of three of, I mean, two of the other, Alex and Karina, I really can see that the need for going forward for sort of case studies to understand what's the role of urban informalities in the urban studies. And as we can see, uh, you know, informality remains under study often uh, uh, explored as a property of cities in global south. Usually we see this kind of trend, you know, informalities standing in global south, or we see the relationship between formality and informality as binary. But however, in this representation, we can see it's not true. There is a you know, value in the gray spaces among formality and informality. And I could see perfectly, there is a discussion of power relation um, among the different, the variety of stakeholders from you know, grassroots that uh, Alex was discussing perfectly. You know, he was talking about um, the grassroots initiatives on the urban informality and the interplay of these actions um, through practices of power. And the role of, in the meantime, Michele in our paper, or also Karina, as he mentioned somehow, the role of elite informality. So there is a power relation is there, but how can we you know we break it up and uh, you know uh, open it, open up this this dynamic between the actors um, in a more open and transparent. You know, I'm mean, gonna discuss about this. I think that is crucial. Uh, instead of it just putting as an informal, formal as two sides and I say, okay, this actor is related to informal realm and this actor is related to formal and elite. And also in our paper, we discuss about informality can happen in the city hall, you know, among, the for, among those elites and formal. So this is, I think it's something uh, we really need to consider. And I, I'm happy I can see, you know, the papers, all papers, you know, this synergy among these papers, you know, talking about this. Another thing I found it, quite interesting. Um, it's about um, the appreciation I mentioned among this, the gray space um, between, um, between two, you know, two fields. And at the end, I would say the case study would be very helpful. And we can see this paper, you know, we focus on case study to, to go to this narrative, you know, telling us the story, it's always often um, helpful, you know, for, for this discussion. This is just observation I could have it. Miriam, thank you for that. Um, Miriam has woken up very early this morning to join us. So uh, we're grateful for your contribution. Um, I, I see that there's quite a few questions coming through in the chat. So I might go to those questions and we can always return to some of the comments and threads that we've picked up already. Um, now, I'm wondering if I can open with Wing. Um, if, if perhaps Wing, if you're prepared to unmute yourself, maybe you can ask your question. 
Well, I, I think it, I, I already read my question. Yeah, it, 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 my question is directed to Karina. If I'm not mistaken, you 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 use the term uh, resettlements, but then you you tell a story about uh, the um, the government that give uh, very little compensations that uh, makes the the, the the dwellers of Pluit Reservoir cannot afford to live in uh, in the new, in the public housing. Am I right? So do you think it, it's appropriate to call it a resettlement? So in, in what, uh, in, uh, is it the, the government view uh, or your view in, you know, the term resettlement, you use it, you use it as a part of the formal uh, terminology uh, given by the governments or I don't know. I, I, I'm interested to know about this. Thank you. Thanks, thank Wing. You. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Wing, for your question. I think that's a very uh, good question. Well, actually, uh, if you if you take a look at the history of Indonesian resettlement or evictions or displacement, I think for this case, for the Pluto Reservoir cases, I think the word resettlement remain intact. So it's considered appropriate, even though there's a lot of uh, negative effect remains from these processes. And also the, uh, when you mentioned about that, the government didn't really provide uh, sufficient compensation for the, 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 the informal dweller, that's correct. But uh, the point is that the Pluit Reservoir Resettlement is not uh, a single process. It's more like a multifaceted uh, process. So in between 2013 and 2015, there, there, are a lot of, there were a lot of things that was happening. And if you can, uh, from my, my research, I can see that there are at least three different stages of uh, the process of resettling, moving the people out of the area to the another uh, area, to the public housing. So the first is the post-flood resettlement, which is completely a resettlement because the people were actually uh, voluntarily moved because the government offered them uh, a place in a public housing. And then the second one is the Eastern side story, or the, the, the Western side of the reservoir story, which was very conflicted and lots of people were in tension with the government because so many uh, accumulation actors were, uh, were present in that area. And then we can also see that in 2015, the process of resettling people who, who were resettled in the Eastern side of the reservoir, which is very, uh, run very smoothly because the people were very passive and they were very uh, accepting. And as if, you, if you say that, probably the word is not appropriate. Mm. Well, from my opinion, it remains appropriate because uh, even though most of this uh, resettled population cannot afford to pay their rent in the new public housing, none of them were affected from the public housing yet. So when I did my research in 2018, I can see that a lot of people were unable to pay the rent for more than uh, three, to, three years almost five years after the resettlement. So it was basically the, the government will provide, um, provide subsidy for those people, even though they cannot afford the rent. So yes, I think resettlement, the word is still appropriate because it's not, uh, it's not merely an affliction. It's not merely a displacement. Some of them were displaced because we cannot trust back who are actually uh, the, the people, the list of the people who were there, who were in the Pluto settlement, uh, who were in the Pluto reservoir, and who were relocated to the area. Not, I cannot find the data, the clear data. But since the government remained provided a place for them to stay, regardless of its condition, I can yeah, argue that it's the word resettlement remains appropriate. Thank you, Karina. Yeah. Thank you, Karina, and thank you, Wing, for, for your question. Um, Stephanie, um, would you like to ask your question? Hi there, thanks for um, three very, very nice presentations. Um, I had, I guess, quite a, a general question for both Karina and Alex, which is really thinking about um, what the lessons might be that you would draw in terms of thinking through um, how we rethink or better engage urban planning for the poor. Um, and particularly thinking about how some of these visions that are articulated by residents then, if, if this is offering lessons for rethinking planning, how that's either in dialogue with or navigating or somehow intention or what the relationship is with uh, more dominant or traditional approaches by uh, the state in your contexts. So Alex, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Stephanie, for the question. Um, 
I would say definitely that uh, for the for the planning practices, uh, planners should sit closely with uh, these initiatives or this context. I think uh, as a first as a first lesson is to get closer and and think their practices and their role in the process, uh, staying understanding first from the perspective of uh, of the dwellers of informal settlements and at the same time uh, putting actions in place together uh, part of the um, the alternative and informal actions that are being framing as case studies in Brazil shows um, uh, actors uh, without requesting uh, authorizations for local government or or any authority putting interventions in place and that practice is disrupts actions that getting the attention of, of the of the government and creating opportunities for reframing the the planning schemes and the the modes of intervention thanks alex and i guess the question was also directed at you karina if you have yeah. a, a quick response thank thank you Steffi, for your question i agree with alex but i mean uh from the Indonesian context, from my research, I can see that one of the challenges that urban planners have, or the urban planning system have, we have in Indonesia is that it was, it is highly paternalistic. So what happened with this paternalistic government is that the state or the planner always put themselves above of the, the people, above of the society. So in, in the case of political reforms, resettlement, it, it's really evident that the government, the urban planner, always assume that they know best, they know what best for the people. And they rarely uh, engage the people to really consider what's their thought about the plan, what do they actually need for the resettlement and so on and so forth. So I think unless the government can, I mean, urban planner can shifting this highly paternalistic way of thinking, knowing what best for the people, things will never really change. I mean, that's a white may have to, but I agree with Alex, but if, if the, the, the community can, uh, can actually be more proactive in saying, stating what their, uh, uh, yeah, their, their, their preference is, maybe that will challenge the government, how they see this relationship between the state and the society, because yeah, it's, you know, it's really difficult when you, you know, you have this point of view for a long time, the state over the society. And then if you want to challenge it directly, I think that's really a very challenging thing. Thanks. Thanks both. Thanks, Karina. Um, Manis, Manis has a question for the panel. Manis, would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, hey, um, although I thought Raiden is before me, but that's okay. Um, I'll be quick. Uh, I think it started off as a question for Karina, but but my point was sort of more about everyone because I think there's a tendency in, in the way that we try and be very investigative, like journalists, like in, in, in informal research, uh, well, research on informality, that we try and situate and locate these actors that have, you know, different allegiances, uh, different levels of agency, you know, are they more on the state side? Are they more on the are they middlemen? So there's a lot of energy put into kind of locating these individual actors um, and sort of assigning roles to them. Um, and I'm sort of, because I'm generally working within assemblage, uh, I was thinking about how you all thought about uh, thinking about the idea of uh, these uh, assemblages that actually maintain power structures rather than individuals. And in that sense, the individuals are not where you are, the individuals are not the unit of analysis. The unit of analysis becomes the assemblage uh, that maintains power structures or has a tendency to move towards a more, uh, a less sort of uh, powerful structure. And so that kind of a model allows for like individual bodies within the assemblage to kind of have more mobility and growth or change. Uh, so like, how do you think through that? A uh, very interesting question, Manis. Thank you for that. I was so our panel, um, I was wondering maybe Michaeli and Miriam, if you'd like to have a go. Um, 
<laughs> I see we're, pointing at each, we're pointing at each other. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give a one it's a super question. And obviously, I'm partial to the assemblage approach, which we don't use in the paper, just to clarify. But I, I think, Manas, one quick reaction there is obviously there are cases, a case where there are certain individuals, especially in the royal family, that there are in an assemblage parlance obligatory passage points for some um some of those politics right not just the shape but certain certain individuals but i t i tend to agree I, I actually i agree with you that there are actually certain settings um where the power lies or not or shifts uh, and those settings uh, move and i guess it's partly our point that some of those settings and individuals move between different um informal stages uh, sometimes to the formal stage but um, and then very quickly, Alex and Karina, and I think we've got one or two questions um, we can finish off with. Alex. Um, maybe I just would add, uh, would add on Mena's comment about the, the assemblage and um, maybe I, I would suggest keeping the both approaches because it's important also to understand in many cases how particular groups of persons it creates these structures of the assemblages and and keeps running the same structures. So having both both visions together is important. That that speaks to issues we see on political oligarchies uh, with our monarch monarchy in Brazil. But we would see this this families running uh, and changing the the structures of power in institutions at the same time. So having that look on the institutions and the persons behind that is really important simultaneously. I would say. Thank you. And Karina, do you have, do you want to? Uh, yes, I agree with both uh, Michaela and also Alex comment about it. So in my opinion, both approaches are important, but as you say that, I think uh, putting lots of energy in understanding who's playing what role is really, it's really essential for understanding informality because in informality, you cannot find it directly in the documents, everything. So before you can move to more assemblage analysis of the, of the cases, I think it's really important to put attention on understanding this role of the individuals, their agencies, things like that. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. Rewa, you have a very short question there, but I was wondering if you'd like to share it with us. Yeah, I think um, to some degree, Manas's question was uh, an excellent preface to that. But I was wondering, like, looking at the system, do you feel like informality has been somewhat assumed uh, to be a certain way in the formal systems? Like, they've assumed that this is going to exist. This is going to deal with some aspects that perhaps the formal system doesn't have the capacity to deal with. Um, yeah, that was my question. Open to the panel. Could I? <clears throat> Kim, please. Let's make a comment. I, I, it's a very interesting discussion. I'm thinking about the triangulate relations between the three papers and the, the kind of dilemma that this throws up that on the one hand, governments are legitimated by being seen to implement the, uh, the will and the interests of the people. And so the informality in that sense, uh, bubbling up from the, from the uh, population uh, is a kind of legitimator. And so to engage in co-production uh, as in Jakarta and elsewhere uh, can be seen to, and these co-production pr processes can be seen to uh, legitimate governance. Uh, but at the same time, we, we see from the, the work of Mariam and, uh, and Michele, the, the way in which uh, moving into this between zone, um, it, uh, between formal, neither formal nor informal, um, moves planning into a kind of um, a place where it's hidden from public scrutiny. It's into a kind of a backstage. Uh, and it, uh, so it's not really a question. It's a it's a dilemma that I think that we need to spend a lot more time thinking harder about. Thank you, Rima and, and Kim. Panel, any any reflections or any reactions? And I also I agree. Miriam, please. I, I totally agree with Kim. And I think um, it's a question that we need really, you know, reflect on it. And I would also add, it really depends on the culture and how the politics practice in embedded in that context. So if you look at the case of Dubai, you know, in the stereotype studies, they, we always, we often hear that, okay, there is no politics happening there, you know, 
So politics, what does that mean? There is no politics what's happening. So we argue in that paper, actually there is politics happening there between this gray zone, you know, between this informality and formality. So adding the culture element in the practice of politics and in the governance, I think it would be also helpful for digging more on this reflection. Thank you, Miriam. Anyone else? I think I would just make a, another comment on the, the thinking or, or, or thinking of the, of the this gray zones of the informality uh, that speaks back to the, the ontology of how we conceive that. Uh, looking back on the institutional, uh, there's a kind of fluidity in certain things that that would hold for uh, affirming something as from a uh, practice or a uh, planning practice, formal or informal, um, holding back to the law side, the, the legalist law of the legalist, legalist side of, of thinking on these things. And in Brazil, uh, the recent political uh, environment has shown um, the, f the, the, f the volatility actually of these things, of the, the, the legalist system. Um, uh, where laws and practices are are formalized by quick swifts and, sh and shifts on, on the legalist side. Uh, so I think that that I, my understanding the 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 volatility of of the legal framework behind how we conceptualize the thing. Uh, I, I think I also add something on on this reflection. I think we are going to close on on that note. Um, and look, we are just starting this conversation. And I want to say thank you to our presenters for such thought provoking uh, presentations today. And I'm sure I, I, I share the views of my colleagues that I look forward to the to an ongoing discussion. And you raised some really interesting tensions and paradoxes and and issues that I look forward to returning to. Um, so, before I close, I, I'd like to um, say that there, this isn't the end, that there is um, a PhD colloquium coming up that some of you may be interested in attending. So, the space for engagement and epistemic diversity, excuse me, SEED, uh, which is led by Tanzil Shafiq and Renan Reccio, is hosting its first panel, its first ECR research colloquium on November 27th at 5 p.m. Melbourne time. Um, and if you are interested in, in checking that out, just have a look at the INFER website, infer.org. Um, I want to thank you again for your time, your, your questions, and of course, the Karina, Alex, Michaela, and Miriam um, for your terrific presentations today. So I'm gonna hang back for a few minutes because the uh, the request was made by a, a colleague of ours that um, some people, folks like to stay, stay behind for another 10 or 20 minutes to continue the conversation. So if that's you, come and hang out and I look forward to continuing the discussion there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Great work. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you.